Hello, Lena. Welcome to Mr. Quaker's Teachers. In this lesson, I'll be analyzing Percy Bershe Shelley's poem, Ozymandias. It's part of the anthology for the GCSE and OIGCSE for 2023 to 2025. Um, the analysis will also be helpful for those maybe writing any other kind of exam where they're required to speak about Ozymandias or, you know, you're just you just love poetry and want to understand more about the poem. So I'll speak about the the themes in the poem, the figures of speech, the point of view, the poet's tone, the mood, that's how the reader reacts to Shelley's words, the poetic devices that are used in the poem, the rhyme scheme, and other stylistic devices that Shelley uses to strikingly present the remains, dilapidated remains of um, a character or somebody that he he names King Ozymandias. So please pay attention, and then um, I'm sure the analysis will help you greatly when you're tested on the poem. Let's dive in. Now let me begin by speaking about the poets. Percy Bersi Shelley. He was born on the 4th of August 1792 and he died on the 8th of July 1822. He was a British writer who is considered one of the major English romantic poets. He is considered a radical in his poetry as well as in his political and social views. Although he did not achieve fame during his lifetime, but recognition of his achievement in poetry grew steadily following his death. And he became an important influence on subsequent generations of poets, including Robert Browning, Alexander Charles Swinburne, Thomas Hardy, and W. B. Yeats. American cre um, literary critic Harold Bloom described Shelley as, quote, a superb craftsman, a lyric poet without rival, and surely one of the most advanced skeptical intellects ever to write po um, poem. Now, among his best poem or his best work of poetry is the poem Ozymandias. That's the poem we are going to deal with, which he wrote in 1818. Now, one of the things I want to say and then get it out of the way is that even though this poem appears to be focused or indirectly referencing the ruler of that day, I think it's a, a sort of like a cautionary tale for all of us, rulers or not, even though the, the focal point here is on King Gozemandes, that over time, whatever we've achieved, our legacy is going to speak for us. So that's one of the key themes in the poem. So legacy is a key theme in the poem. The power of time is also another key theme. So we are going to see how Shelley strikingly presents that using the story that he recounts for, that he was told by a traveler about the remains of um, Ozymandias. So this is how the poem appears. It's actually a sonnet, a 14-line poem. And then it's, it, it has a rhyme scheme. We're going to talk about that um, later on. Now, this analysis has a second um, analysis as well, why I speak about the elements of literature in Ozymandias. So please listen to both analysis. And then that will help you all prepare you, I think, better to understand the poem. So this one, I'm going to be using rolling annotations with color codes. But then in the other one, it's going to be in note form. So you're going to see in detail maybe the themes I've looked at in the, that we've seen in the poem, the point of view and whatnot. So my advice is that please listen to them. And both of them are part of the course on the website. And let me begin by reading the poem, Ozymandias by Percy Bashi Shelley. I met a traveler from antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and snare of cold command tell that its cup towel those passions red, which yet survived, stamped on these life's lessons. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck. Boundless and bare, the lone and level stand stretch far away. So that essentially is the poem. Now the first thing I want us to look at in the poem is the way the poem opens. It's very arresting. You know, so Shelley speaking with the first person narrative voice, evidenced by his use of the first person singular pronoun, I, which implies that he's recounting a past first-hand personal experience. So this is something that he experienced, right? I also tells that he was probably alone when he met the traveler. He tells us the traveler. Now, this is really, really important for me because I think that 
there's this way that Shelly tries to hide or he doesn't want to reveal the identity of whoever it is that spoke to him. So he uses the, 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 the personage of a traveler to shroud the personality. So that, I mean, the rulers of that day will not find it. And I think he also does quite, uh, uh, he does it quite strikingly when he talks about Ozymandias. Because Ozymandias is not the name of any god. I'm sorry, any ruler. Now, there have been um, some people who have said that it's the name of one of the pharaohs, the early pharaohs. But then the fact that he does not use any ruler that people can tie to gives him that, you know, um, um, this thing to check responsibility if ever they come for him and say, I mean, why did you, why did you, why, why are you writing this? You just say, well, I'm just talking about the story of somebody from a bygone era. Now, I also, uh, I also tells that he's probably alone or he was probably alone. So the poetic voice was probably alone when he met the traveler. So he does not have a witness to corroborate his encounter. So, you know, so the reader has to take his word for it. So I met a traveler from antique land. I, he didn't say we. So it's important because it's like, you have to take my word for it and believe what I'm saying. The succeeding two words of the line, met a, suggest that he had a physical encounter with the individual. Now for us in the 21st century, it may, be, it may be something that, you know, we know that, okay, we can meet people physically or online, right? But then he tells us here that, see, I met. So I physically met, meet, met. I didn't read about it. I wasn't told about it. I met someone who told me this. So it's like, you know, it's a first-hand account. Met A also tells that his meeting with the unnamed individual was unplanned. That is, the meeting was by chance. Finally, Met also creates the impression that he wants the reader to know that he's not lying or exaggerating, but he's only recounting his experience. Now, if you observe something, we see that Shelley is using flashback, right? From the onset of the, of the poem, we see the use of flashback, why he begins to tell, tell us the reader about something that happened a while ago. So it's not something that is really uh, recent. So the use of flashback is, is a device, you know, a striking device that Shelley uses to recount his experience with this nameless traveler. Furthermore, his description of the individual as a traveler suggests that the person is some sort of, a, of an itinerant adventurer or traveling tradesman or troubadour or something like that. Somebody who is constantly traveling and so has been to a lot of places. It, it is also likely that the unnamed traveler traveled with a caravan because that was the main method of travel in those times. You know, these are like a bygone era. Maybe, I mean... He, that's the sense that I get because he talks about the man coming from an antique land. So like somebody who traveled with a caravan, you know, caravan is like, um, almost like, um, multiple vans that with which people travel usually over long distances for, for, for the sake of security, because if maybe they meet, um, rabbits or something or, um, 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 other people who are thieves, their share number is going to help them withstand the attack of these attack um, robbers now he ends the line by describing the traveler as someone from an antique land from an suggests that the nameless traveler was either a citizen or a visitor to the place that the poet describes as an antique land moreover antique land suggests that the unnamed location was an exotic setting and a place with ancient architecture antique land also conjures the image of a haggard old place that was built millennials ago it was a long time ago you know when i was growing up you, you hear things like maybe timbuktu and then you have like this sense that it's like a very tip of the world you know so from an antique land a place that was built millennia millennia thousands of thousands of years ago now the phrase antique land or the description antique land is also an allusion to antiquity which is a reference to the ancient past, especially the period of classical and other human civilization before the Middle Ages. So this is something from way, 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 time past. Also, his description of the traveler's nation of origin as antique land, antique land sorry, creates the impression that he wants to be vague. You know, that's the point I was trying to make, that he wants to be vague so that no one will be able to verify his claims. So if ever maybe... The king sends people to find out who's the identity of this person you're, you're speaking about. Well, the man mentioned that he came from an antique land. He didn't mention his nation or his state. 
So he wants to be vague. It's a deliberate um, attempt to be vague so that no one will be able to verify his claims. Now, finally, Antikland suggests that the traveler was likely from a classical place from a bygone era. So some place from a bygone era. You know, again, this, this detail about time. You know, we see time in two ways here. Time dealing with um, Ozymandias and then time in, in terms of the location of the setting. So a place that was habit in, inhabited before, but now is no more inhabited. Now, Shelley continues into the second line of the poem with enjambment. So the flow of words from the first line to the second without pause. Now, this is seen in the pauseless flow of words from line one into line two, which allows him to continue without a line break. His use of enjambment also reveals that he had an uninterrupted interaction with the traveler. So they spoke. There was no interruption. See, he, he heard the man or the woman. The, I mean, we are not told about the, the sex or the identity of this person, but he heard them. And he wants to give the reader the same experience as well. So that's why he does not use, you know, a comma at the end of the first line. So he, he had an uninterrupted interaction with this nameless traveler. And he wants the reader to also have the same experience as well. He begins the second line with, who said? Which indicates that his interaction with the individual was verbal. They had a verbal communication. Who said also suggests that all that the poetic voice is narrating is entirely hearsay. So it's not something that can be verified. He told me. You know, it's hearsay. That is, it is not his first hand personal experience. So the poetic voice did not see these things he's going to tell the reader about. Instead, he was the information was relayed to him by a nameless traveler who comes from an antique land. So it's not his personal experience. But it appears that the poetic voice believes the narration of the nameless individual or the nameless traveler that he met. Now, finally, there's a sense that Shelley uses who said as a way to signal that he's repeating the traveler's words verbatim. That's word for word. So that he does not want to be held responsible for what he is about to say. So, who said? I didn't say it, but who said? I met this traveler and then who said? He told me this. So, if they come to him and then they ask him, what, what, who, who, whose words are these? You say, well, is the, is the, these are the words of the ancient traveler from uh, the, the, sorry, the traveler from an antique land. So who said? So he's repeating verbatim or word for word the words of the nameless traveler. Now, something that I found quite strange was that, strangely, um, the poetic voice does not use speech marks, right? So the reader is unsure of who exactly is speaking. Now, if you go down the poem a bit in line 10, when he begins to recount the words on the pedestal, he uses speech marks to indicate to the reader that these are the words of Ozymandias, King Ozymandias. But here, he says, who said, but then there are no um, open or close quotation marks. So the, the reader is actually unsure of the identity of the speaker. Then, after a colon that indicates that he's about to provide details of their conversation, and also creates an excited drum roll effect. He recounts that the traveler said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone. That's what he says, or that's how it ends the second, the second line. Now, for the reader, the fact that the poetic voice does not use speech marks to indicate that he's reproducing the words of the traveler verbatim is surprising. Because his language before now suggested that he was ready to reveal the exact conversation, or at least the words of the traveler. So for me, I found that quite, you know, shocking. However, the detail too provides vis visual imagery and allows the reader to infer that he, that he there is Shelley or the poetic voice. He's speaking about the right and left legs of the statue. Why Vass tells that the legs were enormous or gargantuan in size. The largeness of the legs is important because it suggests that they were unmissable to everyone that went there. So it's not something that is small, it's something that can be seen for miles. The vast size of the legs also tells that they can be seen from great distances. So this is not a hidden statue or something that is, you know, small. They are vast, they are gargantuan, enormous, something that is unmissable. Now additionally, from the word vast, the reader can infer that Constructing the legs took enormous effort because think about it. If they are vast, then even today, in, you know, if we're, we're doing something like this, it's going to take enormous 
effort and maybe days and even with our technology um, years or even months with our technology that we have. But then think about it, that they are vast. It means that they, were, they took enormous effort and was probably done as a show of power by the one who commissioned it. The, the reader would later find out that the mountainous, it's a mountainous replica of King Ozymandias. So the, the statues were built as a show of power. Now, some of the themes, like I mentioned already in the poem, are power, you know, power, the fleeting nature of power, time, legacy. Those are some of the ideas that we see. But here we see that Shelley uses vivid vi visual imagery to represent to the reader the, the, the size, right, of these trunkless legs of stone. Vast also alludes to the might of King Ozymandias and suggests that he wanted to, it to be constructed to celebrate his superiority over other rulers and to display his unfettered authority and power. So this is a show of power by this King Ozymandias who is arrogant and proud. We're going to see that later when we hear his voice. But we see here that when he, uses, he says vast, he provides vivid visual imagery. Now this is really useful because in the GCSE, you may be asked, how does Shelley strikingly use language in Ozymandias? So you have to be able to talk about the use of vivid visual imagery here to talk about the large size. So you, you, you explain the fact that the use of two vast tells us as the right and left le legs, but then the, the statue is enormous. White trunkless also provides vivid visual imagery that the statue does not have a torso, right? So, and then the legs is right and, le and, and, and then the left legs. Now, that's the literal sense. But then figuratively, you can talk about the vastness of the statue as a show of power from Ozymandias. And then to show other leaders and rulers that he has boundless authority, might, and maybe financial, you know, well without to do as he pleases. Hello, Lena. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson so far. This is a sample video analysis of this poem. To access the full analysis, purchase it or the entire course with detailed analysis of all the 15 poems, the elements of literature in each poem, and IGCSE style questions, both passage-based and general. There are also a star quality sample essays as well at mrquakersteaches.com. Find the links in the description. See you in class.